Good morning. I don't know if this is working. I don't think very much is working here at all. So, hi, I'm Bob Dorf. I'm, it's a pleasure to meet with you this morning. Uh, so far, uh, we are about zero for three in technology. It's sort of like writing a bunch of code that causes the servers to melt down in a puddle in the server room. That's about how well we're doing so far today. We're, uh, unfortunately, uh, we were ordered to start 20 minutes late and end 15 minutes early. So my, one of my jobs in college was as a rock and roll DJ. And I used to talk like this real fast, bopped off on the radio till solid gold till six in the morning. And maybe that's the way we get all the words into the speech. Uh, and uh, in addition, after sending the slides to the wonderful button-down organizers four different times, we have no slides. Uh, uh, we, we got them both. As my wife, look, well, we don't have time to do the slides. As my wife repeatedly tells me, I can talk about customer development in my sleep uh, with no slides, no script. And so what I'd like to do in what little time we have is welcome you and uh, tell you some of the key principles at the heart of customer development. Uh, is there anyone in the room who is not an engineer or a developer? Anybody? Two, three, four, okay. Then the most important message for most all of you is the following. Most of you look at startup ideas as something like I am Russian engineer, finest, Russian engineers are known as the finest in the world. I have honors degrees with awards from MSU. I know what the customer wants. I know exactly what features to build. And when I finish building it, they will buy it. And so you lock yourself in a room for three months, six months, a year. You build a product that you have decided the customer wants. You buy balloons, you buy champagne, you launch your company, and only then, after working night and day and weekends and holidays for three months, six months, a year, that's when you discover that it wasn't what the customer wanted, and your business goes in the toilet, and you are very sad, and if you are a really good entrepreneur, you take a weekend off, you go to the mountains, you come back on Monday, and you start again. If you are not a passionate entrepreneur with entrepreneurship in your heart, you go get a job as an IT guy or lady at Gazprom, and you spend the rest of your career in a real job as opposed to in the wonderful world of startups. Me, at the age of 22, I quit a wonderful, wonderful job. In today's US dollars, it paid $300,000 a year for a 22-year-old kid who barely graduated from college because I was too busy starting businesses to go to classes or take tests or silly things like that. Seven startups, two home runs, two okay, and three, the most important three, direct into the toilet. A year of my life for a million dollars of my own money, not investors' money, because what investor would invest in a Stupid 22-year-old who was so stupid he quit a $300,000 job to start a business. And I didn't know what investors were, what venture capital was, what exits were. I did it for the, what I think are the right reasons to start a company. To be in charge, to be my own boss, to build something that was my vision, not the vision of Westinghouse Broadcasting, the people who paid me all this money. And if you are here to learn about building a startup because you want to be rich, that is absolutely the wrong reason. You should be doing this because you want to be independent, because you have a vision of something you want to call it your own. You know how to shape it. You are eager to embrace the uncertainty and the risk of being your own boss and maybe going out without a paycheck for a few weeks or a few months or sometimes even longer. And for a hundred years, more than a hundred years, startups were built on the theory that step one was not a code scheme, was not a wireframe. Step one was you spend a month, two months, three months writing a business plan. 
50, 60 pages, beautifully formatted, nice headers, lots of diagrams and charts. Five spreadsheets at the back. The last spreadsheet, the right-hand column of the last spreadsheet, the top number, nine digits, some usually low hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue, and the bottom number, 15, 20 million. Why? Not because there's an Easter egg in Excel where every number becomes 100 million, but because that's the number an investor needs to see in order to make a Series A investment in your company. Unfortunately, all those numbers, you made them up. You have no idea what your revenue is going to be in the second quarter of next year, or how many salespeople you'll employ in 2016, or how many customers you'll get. It's all fairy tales, total fairy tales. The only facts in a business plan are usually the competitive analysis, sometimes the market size, and usually about 25 or 30% of the bio of the founder is honest facts and the rest is glory and fairy tales. Why would you waste two or three months of your life writing this fairy tale when really the only thing that matters about your business is not the code, it's not even the idea necessarily. The most important single most powerful factor in your business is whether or not customers will buy it. This is a particularly important message for Russian engineers, even more than Silicon Valley engineers or French engineers or you know, software developers in Iran or Italy. Why? Because the attitude that I, I have now worked with about 120 uh, startups here in Russia in four programs of Startup Academy, two MBA programs at Skolkovo, and a variety of other activities. And in uh, May the 12th or 14th, we start Startup Academy 5 by launch gurus, born out of Skolkovo, now an independent training program in customer development. So what is customer development? Simply put, customer development has you on the day you write your very first line of code, usually the day you open the doors to your business, you cut yourself in half. In reality, hopefully, if you are a brilliant engineer, you find an equally brilliant co-founder who is as good and as passionate about customers and sales and marketing as you are at engineering. Why? Well, in Silicon Valley, the rule is almost no investor will put money in a company that doesn't have at least two founders, two founders with very specific, different responsibilities, the hacker and the hustler. The hacker is most all of you right? Talented, hardworking, passionate engineer. The hustler is more like me, customer facing, sales oriented, understands marketing, understands this one I'm not so good at, how to listen and how to process what customers say. And the customer development method urges you, forces you to let your customers design the business for you. And so while the engineer has his or her head in the computer, coding, 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 the, the hustler is out, out of the building, on the street where customers are, finding out what they want, what features they want, what features they don't want, what they're willing to pay, where they would buy the product, how they would learn about the product. And you are doing that in parallel processing so that by the time you are ready to buy the balloons and the champagne and launch the product, you already know how to sell it, where to sell it, who's going to buy it, what partners you need to market it, 
how much people will be willing to pay for it, where they will buy it, where they will learn about it. Because the, the thing that the Russian, in particular, most engineers feel this way, Russians are even more certain that the business is the product. And the greatest product in the world with no customers is not a business. And if you are not dividing your energy almost 50-50, half focused on the customer, the customer needs, the customer desires, and half focused on the product that will meet those needs, the odds are your business will fail. The thing that everybody loves to forget to talk about at conferences like this, which I visit all over the world, the thing that nobody wants to remember or talk about is that when you build a startup to scale, which is what most of you are trying to do, be the next Google or Facebook or Apple or SAP, when you are trying to build a startup to scale, even to much smaller proportions, to only 10 or $20 million in revenue, 97, 98% of those startups fail. And they fail in a pile of blood and sweat and bones and body parts. And they're your and my blood and sweat and body parts. And they fail because you buy the balloons before you figure out why somebody's going to want to buy something, why they're going to want to buy your thing instead of Oracle or SAP or whoever. And you have no business. You have no customers. The way you do this is first, instead of spending eight or 10 weeks or 12 weeks or more writing this beautiful business plan that is full of Fairy, I was going to say something about bulls right now, but it's full of fairy tales. You spend a day working on a business model canvas, a single sheet of paper that outlines not just the product features and benefits, but the customer target, the way you're going to get those customers, the channel, the place you're going to sell to those customers, the way you're going to charge them, what your cost structure looks like. And you do this on a single sheet of paper designed by Alex Osterwalder called the Business Model Canvas. Nine boxes that outline all of the elements of your business. Why do this in a day? Because when you're done, all you really have, you still have the same zero facts that you have if you spent three months writing this business plan full of fairy tales. You have a page outlining you, the founder, your best guesses about what is going to make a good business. And that is the starting point for customer development. And your job shifts immediately in the first week of your business to getting out of the building and talking face to face with dozens and sometimes hundreds of customers until you get to the magical moment of product market fit. I know exactly who my best customer target is, and I know exactly what they want to buy from me. It, and if I talk to 100, if I talk to 10 customers, not 10 are going to buy, but two or three or four are going to buy most of the time, not necessarily all of the time. And if I talk to another 10, the same thing happens. And the same thing happens the next 10 and the next 50 and the next 100. Product market fit. If you don't have it, stop everything because it is almost an absolute certainty that you don't have a business. How do you find product market fit? You use the very first step of customer development called customer discovery. You go out of the building two separate times. The first time, you don't talk about your product or your idea at all. All you talk about is the problem you are going to spend the next five years of your life building a company to solve. Why do you care if anybody cares about the problem? Because if they don't, there's no market for your solution. 
if it's a problem they have once a year or twice a year, or if it's a problem they don't worry about too much, that's not the heart of a successful, repeatable, scalable, profitable business. You might make a little money for a little while, but you have not built a sustainable business with success potential. So you go out and you talk about the problem. How serious is it? Is it a problem you have once a year or once a week or once a day or once an hour? Is it a problem that is so severe that you worry that you're going to lose your money, your house, your wife, your job if you don't solve the problem? If I wake up in the middle of the night every night worried that if I don't fix this tomorrow, I'm going to get fired or lose my house, I'm probably interested in the solution you are trying to build. If I worry about it once a year, I'm probably just not that interested. Or if it's going to be an irritation and not a major problem, I'm probably not that interested. And if you don't take the time to identify whether you are focused on a serious problem, you are building a business on quicksand. You are building you know, a castle in the sky with almost zero hope of success. This methodology has developed not by me, initially developed by Steve Blank, legendary Silicon Valley serial entrepreneur, eight startups, number eight, had reasonably good success, reached a market cap of $8 billion, US dollars. After you do startup number eight and it's that big, it's very hard to do startup number nine and try to beat your biggest success to be, you know, do a startup with more than $8 billion. And so Steve has spent the last 15 years of his life developing, testing, refining this methodology that is now being used by thousands of startups all over the world, taught in more than 300 universities. Our book is a bestseller here in Moscow or here in Russia, in China, in the US, in France, uh, in Port, uh, Brazil and Portugal because it gives you the pathway to figure out how to be sure that you are on the road to a business, not just where the code strings work and where all the software is in place and where it solves the technological problem, but where as good as the product is, the customer demand is ex as enthusiastic and you can find your customers at a price you can afford. Everybody loves to say, oh, I know how I'll find customers. I'll buy Google AdWords. They cost $2, so for $2, that's my cost of marketing. Well, for $2, that's just your cost of a click. In most cases, the way to think about that $2 is 100 clicks probably get you an email address from one customer. Sometimes it's a little better than that. Often it's worse than that. So now you just spent not $2 for a click, but $200 for an email address of a prospect. And then the same math applies. A typical safe internet marketing standard is that for every 100 email addresses you get, you get one customer. So that means the cost of that customer is $20,000, not $2. Now, if you are selling airplanes, $20,000 customer acquisition cost is fine. If you're selling a smartphone download or a $40 piece of software, you are out of business you know, before you can say, buy my product. Figure that out before you start spending the money on the advertising. Right? In 1999, there were more than 30 ads on the Super Bowl for software, for web services, for dot-coms. $3 million for 30 seconds. Of those 30 ads, 28, 27 companies of those 30 are out of business a year later, two years later. Why? Because they threw the $3 million against the wall, hoped for the best, never tested in small football games, in small cities, whatever, had no idea whether it would work or not. 
You, the same way you test code strings, bite by bite in Agile, you test marketing tests, sales tests, pricing tests, all of that. Um, so I want to have some time for questions, and since they cut my time in half, I want to leave you with one particular example of one of the most brilliant uh, um, uses of this approach, uh, probably in uh, marketing history. A company called Mailbox.com. The idea was simple. It was our lives are chaotic. Most of us try to manage our lives through our inbox. For the grand sum of 200 US dollars, they produced two viral videos about how crazy our lives are, how messy our inboxes are, and their promise, their idea, their minimum viable product, their vision was organize your life in your inbox, merge your appointments, your to-do list, and your urgent email right in your face where you look all the time. But they didn't quite get around to building the product. They built a little website that talked about it. They built these two viral videos that were so cute and so engaging that in a matter of a few weeks, they got 1.6 million views. 1.6 million at a grand cost of $200. What happened next? Within a few short weeks, they had the email addresses of 750,000 people who wanted to try the product on a 30-day free trial. But, you know, they were pretty busy, these guys at Mailbox.com. They never got, down, got around to finishing the product development. And you know what happened? They answered the most important question that every investor has that no investor ever sort of asks honestly and directly. This is a great idea. You have a great resume. How do I know if anybody's ever going to buy this? Their answer was, well, we have 750,000 people online in three weeks wanting to try and buy our product. So rather than finish the software, they sold the company with no product to Dropbox.com for 100 million US dollars in cash. They proved that they had a market opportunity, that they had product market fit, and that they had found in a few short weeks 750,000 people interested in buying their product. This is the modern way of thinking about your startup. Don't just think about the code string, the wireframe. Don't just think about the features and functions. Spend some of your time, of course, on that. But spend most of your time on how do I make this a business that's sustainable, that's repeatable, that's scalable, and that is sooner or later profitable. Um, this book in Russian, in English, in Portuguese, in whatever language you like, including now Farsi and a uh, um, couple of other exotic, Turkish, a few others, 24 languages, I think, in all, gives you a roadmap for this new way of thinking. In, uh, on May 14th, I'm back here for my, I think, ninth trip and my fifth Launch Guru's Startup Academy, or 10-week program that drives you step by step through this process and forces you to get out of the building, talk to your customers, find out what they want, and let them design your marketing plan, your business plan for you. There is no better advisor. Steve Blank and I are nowhere as good in advising your company as your customers are, if you solicit and prospect and use their feedback and drive it into the product, drive it into the marketing, into the sales process. And so I think in closing, let me say that if you are committed to building a scalable startup, you are making a commitment of at least 20,000 hours of your life five years, 80 hours a week, no weekends, no vacations, no friends, no soccer. 
you know, almost no sex even. Unless you can, you know, be awake at 4 o'clock in the morning before you brush your teeth and go back to work at 5. If you're going to work that hard, please, please stop. Think about this approach. If you're going to work that hard, don't you want to build something that's really great? Not in your eyes, not in my eyes, not in your investors' eyes, but in the eyes of the only people who matter the eyes of your customers. I'd like to shut up now and answer your questions in the four minutes and seven seconds they've allowed us to talk. Thank you. How does uh, Twitter fit the concept? How does Twitter fit the concept? Uh, how much did they spend to launch Twitter? $200? $300? It was started Actually, it's an interesting example. The MVP, the launch product of Twitter, got its first exposure to customers in a brilliant way at South by Southwest, where you have 40,000 drunk engineers trying to find the next party, the next free beer. It caught on like wildfire. They instantly found their audience. Their customer was techno-forward, um, comfortable with smartphones and, you know, didn't want to write paragraphs, um, and they fell in love with it. Twitter, I think, is an interesting example where they still, even though they have had a very nice IPO, they still don't have a clue what their revenue model is. Neither did Instagram, didn't keep them from selling the company for a billion dollars, right? But. You know, Twitter has attracted, it's, you know, like the sex kitten of the IPO year. So they have attracted enough money to buy a year or two to figure out a revenue model, right? When Google started, it had no revenue model. It had no ad words. And their investors said, first, let's own the world of search. And if we can own the world of search, which it looks like Google can do, we can, the dog sleeping in the corner can figure out how to make money. I think the dog was pretty smart, I, you know, and they did it very well. Uh, my bet, personally, I know some of the investors in Twitter, I bet against, because I don't see how anybody ever pays attention to it. But that's one opinion. My opinion is irrelevant. What matters is the millions of tweeters and whether they'll read the ads, because if they'll read the ads, there's a revenue model. If they won't, It'll be, you know, it'll go the way of uh, MySpace and hundreds of others that didn't stay in touch with their customers. Another one? Yes, sir. Thank you. At which stage of startup development you would recommend to find in investors? When to find investors? For example, from the very beginning. Or right. Very beginning. simple question. The answer is delay, delay, delay as long as you possibly can. Because the farther along the curve you get of showing that you have customers, that you have prospects, the more equity you protect for yourself and your founding team members. The, you know, the closer you can get to answering the investor's question well of, do we have any customers? Well, we have 750,000 outside the store waiting for us to open the door. The valuation of your company just went up dramatically. When your pitch is, we are four honors MSU engineering graduates and we have a great idea, the investor's in charge of the negotiation. One more? No. No more. Well, it's been nice and brief talking to you. We're talking in tweets, I guess. Good luck. Thank you.